This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great conversation with Eric Partaker who was voted CEO of the year last year and is co-founder and CEO of Chilangos, which is a chain of Mexican restaurants in the UK. And he's also a high performance coach and he coaches a select number of entrepreneurs around mindset and uh, high performance and all of that stuff. So really cool. And we hear about his story. He started his career at McKinsey and Skype and met his co-founder and business partner at Skype. And he um, gives us some insight into the challenges they faced early on and how they grew and scaled a business which is awesome. And then we talk a bit about coaching, leadership, entrepreneurship, and uh, all the mindset stuff that goes with that. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Eric, thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Pleasure. We finally made it. So how was your commute in? Yeah, not bad. You're saying you were used to living in me in Highbury. Yeah, I, I I moved to the UK from Oslo, Norway in oh. um, 2004 and joined Skype in its early days shortly thereafter. And then yeah, most of my life was spent in Islington. Amazing. And actually, the Lovely. first restaurant I started with uh, Chilango, the, the, the restaurant chain I founded, was on Upper Street. Oh, really? Islington, or is on Upper Street in Islington. Nice. But yeah, now I live in Wimbledon. So. How come you, you came over to the UK? Well, yeah, funny story. So I'm, I'm half American, uh, half Norwegian. I grew up for the most part, though, in Chicago and then moved back to Norway to spend time with my biological father and some of my siblings. At the time, I was working with McKinsey and Company. And um, so I transferred from the Chicago to their Oslo office. And I lasted about two and a half years <laughs> before I realized that I had been tainted by big city living. <laughs> and then Oslo was way too small. So how many people in Oslo? Oh, yeah, you're talking like uh, hundreds of thousands. Oh, right, right. You know, there, there's only five, five million people in all, oh, right, right. In all of Norway. And so I set my sights, you know, further afield and um, still had the sense of adventure, though. So I didn't want to move back to the States. And at the time, I didn't want to learn another language, even though I've learned more since. <laughs> but um, Did you speak, you spoke fluent Norwegian. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, English. So I, I thought London, because they speak English. Why not? <laughs> and that was the only reason. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I could say that I was like absolutely enamored with the city and, you know, couldn't wait to get there, but no. Nope. It's a cool city. It's <laughs> yeah. a cool city. Yeah, it grew on me. Yeah. yeah so. did, did you did you have a job here to come to or you just decided to come and then yeah, yeah. I, I worked for a, a short while with a, a small private equity group here. But, you know, shortly after arriving, I had been using Skype uh, quite early on, uh, earlier than most people, given its Scandinavian roots. And I, I looked at the product and I thought, this is going to be exciting. And so I, I joined them when they were you know, very, very small. We were about 30 or so people in an unmarked office on Lexington Street in Soho. Cool. And it was a rocket ship, help, you know, help build up the company. And you know, it was an exit two years later to eBay for uh, about two and a half billion. Wow. Yeah, incredible experience. I, and, and McKinsey and Skype, those experiences were incredibly formative thanks to those experiences as they able to start the restaurant chain yeah and you so you did, you did mckinsey for a few years yeah then went in uh, in oslo in chicago and and oslo okay yeah also did a, a bit of non-profit work mostly thereafter it was skype and uh, and then chilango yeah great why did you start how did it all come about so growing up in chicago means you have a lot of Mexican friends and <laughs> eat lots of Mexican food. Because at the time, it was, uh, when I was growing up, it was the nation's second largest population of Mexicans. Right. Um, we're living in Chicago. Um, so LA was number one, Chicago number two. So yeah, to grow up not eating Mexican food there is setting yourself up for starvation. <laughs> so so, uh, so I loved it. And, um, you know, typical thing, as you can imagine, in university, you go out at night and then you soak up the evening with a burrito. And, oh, really? Uh, well, here it's a kebab. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And um, 
Yeah, so I, I was, it was a case of missing the food. And then I thought back, when did I have the most fun in life? You know, at that time. And it was when I was um, working in restaurants and bars. And then when I had been at McKinsey, you know, I saw the professional corporate side of that. I had some restaurant clients, you know, massive corporations. Yeah. And then Skype, you know, gave me that taste for entrepreneurship. So I thought, well, why not? you know, create a restaurant to make and, you know, serve the food that I'm missing. And, Definitely. I mean. and, um, and, and, and the real, you know, the real reason it started, though, at, at the end of it all is because of um, my business partner, who I started it with, so Dan Houghton. We were working together at Skype as a two-person uh, team. I was going to ask, yeah. So it's a classic proof or example of first who, then what. Yeah. You know, because we work so well. We, we, we had a pact. Whoever yeah. had an idea first would tell the other and we'd start that business. Ah, uh. And, and so, you kind of worked in the trenches together. You yeah, knew what you were about. Yeah. yeah, and very, very different. Like in the, um, you know, in the psychometric, you know, profile, and that's all the rage these days. We, yeah, yeah, we test absolutely opposite spectrums, like literally oh. polar opposites. Amazing. So the combination <laughs> yeah. is really good. And um, how long had you, you'd worked yeah. together for a couple of years? Yeah, got on really well. And yeah, and we've worked together now for you know fourteen years. Wow. Yeah. So that. That prompted, um, you know, the desire to do my own thing. And had you always I, wanted to do your own thing? Yeah, al- always. It's just that classic thing of just you have the desire, but you don't know what to do. Yeah. But but because the desire is there, you know, you're constantly keeping your eyes open, right? Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly it it hits you. And Skype was was really good for it because um, uh, so voice over IP had existed for ten years prior to Skype's arrival. So it's like the question then is, you know, at that time, why was Skype doing so much better? Why were they so much superior to everything else out there? And and I zeroed in on two things that they were absolutely obsessed with product quality you know the product again at that time was vastly superior and they wrapped it all up in a brand that people love you know so the the strap line at the time was uh, the whole world can talk for free yeah nice so it creates yeah. a nice revolutionary yeah. spirit right you're doing the world good yeah, yeah. and so we you know built chilango especially in, in the early days on those two core tenants so have incredible product quality it's all about the flavor you know at the end of the day and then wrap it up in a brand that people love and uh chilango's one word brand distillation is vibrancy so you know we yeah. we um we exist to make the world a more vibrant place so, love it yeah and how, how was it in the early days oh god <laughs> yeah it's uh, you're working in the kitchen the first three months you know there's been a couple of times and this is one of them the first three months it's like i thought i was going to break like <laughs> just like completely fall apart you're doing absolutely everything you are getting signal after signal that it's not going to work and you're physically and mentally just depleted destroyed yeah, yeah. exhausted you know a typical day was waking up at 4 a.m to get to smithfields to buy our you know meat direct well every day do that uh three days a week and uh and then you would work until 10 p.m or midnight so on those days you're often getting like four or three hours you know of sleep and then you got that bumper day say in between the the smithfields trips you need the eight every night not like yeah, yeah not like you know three, four, and then eight, you're still in a deficit, right? Yeah, yeah. So that in the face of everything that was against us, it was, um, yeah, it was really challenging. The sleep thing's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're not getting enough. You're just mentally like drained and exhausted. Yeah, a fantastic book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. So if you have less than six hours of sleep, you have the equivalent ability of somebody that's had a six pack of of beer. (laughs) In terms of cognitive ability, your reaction times, yeah, and all of that. So it's not you're you're not optimized to run a business like that. But you can you can try and accumulate the eight hours. Mm. You don't have to get it in the. uh, all it all in the evening yeah but I mean, if you can find a time and who can but you know if you can find a time to take a little nap <laughs> during yeah, work but that was impossible in the, in, in, in no, the early no. in the early days i mean one of the things i've had going all the way through is is great you know coaches and mentors interesting did you have that from day one yeah i mean yeah. you know mckinsey you know was a culture that was you know set up in that way if you look at mastery and any anybody who's achieved you know mastery at any level of course they engage in that whole you know the the ten thousand hour um thing but you know, they also have someone in the background to help them out. So I was fortunate enough to have, you know, people to call on, help me see through it all. So how did you use them? You'd meet them what, once a quarter or something and kind of step away and like work on the business rather than in the business. Well, I'd love to say that I was working on the business. The whole, it wasn't the case, <laughs> right, you right. know, and I know that's the dream and it's all the rage to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I was in the business to keep the business alive. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. early days. Yeah, yeah. I'd say, you know, it's not like that now. 
out, but I didn't even have the capacity to meet with anybody regularly. So that was more like, you know, using person on an ad hoc basis. Yeah. Now, you know, when we're in our scallop stage as a company, I have a, you know, weekly coaching and also off coaching outside of Chilango in somewhat, you know, the same capacity like I received myself. Interesting. So then at what point did you kind of come out all of that startup grind and then think, right, you know, first one's kind of moving nicely. Like, was it hard for you to just you need adjust to. your mindset and be like, right, let's let's crack on? Yeah, it's not as easy as just saying, okay, it's time to mature and let go and focus just on the business because there's that necessity thing going on where you just don't have a choice. Um, but uh, that has to go very, very quickly in the restaurant industry because of the physical presence requirement. You, you just can't be in all places. So even just to get to the second unit, you need to start creating you know, a strong team underneath you. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say it was in the trenches with no ability to, to look over the, the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the first year and then after that you know we started to be able to you know come up for air what other challenges then did you start to to face you, you talked a bit about it sounded mostly actually your time sleep and time has been yeah i mean so that's again that's like the typical grind i think that happens in any business after that first stage after we got through that you know i imagine all entrepreneurs um, certainly those that I coach, they, you know, they, they also have these, these challenges. So, so basic things like feeling like you're just not winning the day. You don't feel efficient or productive. You're bouncing around from one person's agenda to the next rather than your own. Feel like you're constantly busy, but you're not necessarily working on the right things. Yeah. yeah. So there's that. So like the classic kind of important, urgent yeah. type stuff. So yeah. there's that bucket of, you know, challenges. Then there was, uh, yeah, you know, questions of balance. So for a long time, it was, it felt like it was all about work and it came at the price of my health and, you know, presence at home. And that's not sustainable either. Then there's challenges around scale. It's yeah. one thing to be a founder. It's completely different. I had to take a really, really focused and created, you know, my own like boot camp or development plan to go from founder to the to that that CEO of the year accolade that I yeah, picked yeah. up earlier in yeah, the year. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yes. That took a lot of effort. So scaling up yourself, you know, as a leader yeah. and then just making sure the company scales. You know, are, are the people right? Um, is the strategy clear? Is the execution happening without drama? You know, is there enough cash in the business? You know, the, those are the three main areas, you know, of challenges yeah. that I faced and yeah. that I see most entrepreneurs yeah. facing. Yeah. How, how did you get in to move on to your coaching? It's interesting. What? Ah, well, so that's quite cool. So first of all, it was unintended. Right. It yeah. sounds like Chilango was keeping you plenty busy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So two things going on there. So it goes back to our one word brand distillation, vibrancy. I think all, all the great companies out there that go from good to great, they have this intangible one word distillation that sets them apart from their competition. So, you know, for example, Nike's about competition. I'm not sure what JD Sports is about. Um, <laughs> Uh, Disney is about um, making people happy. I'm not sure what Alton Towers is about. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, uh, like Apple might be simplicity. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not, not sure, sure what it's about. Right. But then once you have that, you have to ask yourself, well, how do I stitch everything in the company and align it to that? So our food was vibrant. Uh, audition element in our interview process to find vibrant personalities. The, the restaurant interiors, I'm sure you've been in one. Yeah. They're, they're quite vibrant. Yeah, yeah. But then I thought a little bit more philosophically. So it's like, how do I get someone to shine as vibrantly as possible? And rather than doing something that's very, very scripted, and if we do this, suddenly they smile, I thought, well, what if we hit them here, like right in the soul? And what if we actually create a culture inside Chilanga that helps them become the best version of themselves, professionally, personally? And then I thought they'll shine naturally, quite vibrantly. So we started to do that. And that, that started to happen. And that started to happen. And then right. I was always getting approached by entrepreneurs asking for advice either you know about the skype times or because of what we had done with chilango and i started to drop in some of the things that we were doing internally at chilango in those conversations right and then a weird thing happened where i get an email and somebody said thanks so much for that coffee three months ago you know it changed my life or thanks so much for that chat the other day you totally saved me from doing the wrong thing or you inspired me to do something that i uh, i didn't have the courage to do yeah and so that, that was the trigger that made me think, what do I want to use my free time for? Because it's a free time thing. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot of yeah, yeah. You know, uh, capacity, but I don't play golf. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't play football. I go to the gym, but I, I don't have these like traditional other hobbies. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, you know what? We all need to do something in our free time. 
this is what I would like to do in my free time is kind of shorten the learning curve for other entrepreneurs and use that experience from McKinsey, from Skype, from going from founder to CEO at Chilango. And then lastly, I became obsessed with the whole field of high performance. Here's, did you know this, for example? Did you know that apparently only 1% of people reach their full potential in business or life as defined by themselves if they're asked? No. And no. that's... You know, it's amazing. That, yeah, that, yeah. that goes back to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and, uh, you know, once our basic needs are met, the deepest sense of fulfillment comes from feeling that we've become everything we could. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and that was his original estimate, which has been validated it's by other studies. I wonder why people don't quite make it. Well, I think for a lot of those, those you know, reasons we talked about, they can't overcome you know, basic challenges around how do I win the day, at least from an entrepreneurial point yeah, of view. Yeah, yeah. You know, things aren't balanced. So they have a lot of regret, maybe with their health or with their family, or they just don't, they don't learn from others how to scale properly. Do you know, they're all they're really interesting. I mean, health, health has got to be the most important thing. Mm. And, and certainly also like mental health, mental health and health are just, you know, key. And you yeah. find that people, they often have any excuse, you know, why they can't go and do some exercise. They're too yeah. busy, you know, but we all have 24 hours in a day. It's quite a long time. Exactly. You know, and you only need to really find half an hour, 45 minutes to do some exercise. Mm. For me, exercise really, for my for my brain and for my, my mood, it's amazing. You're so right. When people are in a bit of a rut with their psychology, they often look and stay in the mind when actually, if they thought about their physiology, it drives the psychology. At oh, least I think 90% of the time. 100% I agree. I mean, if I'm, and if I'm out on the road running or I'm lifting weights, I do CrossFit, I went to CrossFit this yeah. morning. I mean, all I was thinking about was, damn, I don't want to lift that weight again. Yeah. Everyone else around me is like going for it. Like, oh, shit. Yeah. Can you keep going? And, and you, I don't, you don't think about anything else. Yeah. So it's really quite meditative. Yeah. And suddenly you're like really ready for the day. Yeah. So two groups tested. Um, one group is on antidepressants, Prozac. Uh, the other group is just asked to go and do a workout in the morning. And the mood boost in the group just focused on going to do a workout is equivalent to the mood boost created by the Prozac, which is crazy. But heavyweight boxer Tyson Fury. Yeah. He fought Deontay Wilder recently yeah. and um, very publicly suffered from uh, mental health issues, yeah. depression, I think he almost committed suicide, all these things. And he, there was an interview with him recently and he, the way he got out of it was he just went to the gym seven days a week. He just dived right back into training. I mean, you, you just feel great. Feel great. You feel better about yourself. Yeah. Scientifically proven to create a mood. The worst goal, again, this is uh, another evidence-based study, is people who have this milestone of, I want to get in shape. And that's not a good goal because, for one, what happens once you achieve it? Yeah. You know, what's keeping you motivated then? Those that fare better are those exercising for the immediate benefit in the moment, such as the mood boost and that it makes you happier. Yeah. So yeah. when they focus on that as a rationale, just like you said with Tyson, then that's no, a much right. better result. You're right. I mean, I feel I feel bad when I don't go to the gym. Yeah. You know, but just in myself, I don't feel good. Yeah. And I have, I'm, I'm in the habit where I want to go. Yeah. You know, I love it. I like to yoga. I like to do these things. And I think when you're running a company, that's how you get, you get balance. You have a good version of yourself, then, you know, it really feeds into everything else. Yeah. You know, from a balance point of view, um, when I'm, you know, coaching someone internally at Chilango or a scale up, you know, CEO or founder externally, you know, I focus on getting the energy right. Like you just said, that's, you know, energy health is, is the foundation. And then, you know, we have two things. Well, according to Sigmund Freud, we have two right. things we seek to optimize in life after that, which is our work and our love for our relationships. Yeah. And so making sure those are both right It's important. Well. What's, what's really interesting, I think, certainly in this country, and probably America is the same, is when, when you're an entrepreneur um, and you start the business, you only really ever get asked two questions by people. Everyone asks me, when am I planning on selling? And yeah. how many people do I employ? Yes. <laughs> now, I mean, you know, the number of people doesn't mean you're making any money. I just find the, the question of when do you want to sell, um, it's a weird one because it implies as a business owner or an entrepreneur is you have to want to build something to sell. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and it, I meet a few people and they're thinking, you know, how's it going? And they're, they're in this like thing, I've got to, got to, got to build it to sell. I've got to, mm -hmm. what and do you think about that? So you have to stay true to what your motives are, you know, and what, what motivates you. And if, if that's somebody that's motivated by that, well then, well then, you know, it's important to stay true to that and just design goals and, you know, plans around that. Um, personally, I think if, if you keep your head down and just focus on, uh, making your people as happy as possible, serving a great product and, you know, blowing away your guests or customers, whatever you refer to them as, um, that the good things will happen, you know, as a byproduct yeah. of that. No, that's, that's true. 
Yeah, that's true. Do you do do you do much work with people's um, attitudes? So, oh, so apart from completely. you know a good ground game, being organised, healthy and stuff, you then find you know mindset, you know being positive and the way you look at different scenarios. I feel that's a massive part of um, the coaching that I do. So let's go with those energy, work, and love yep. areas, right? So I have three identities that I set every single day. In that, it could be a person that. I want to kind of step into it from like an alter ego point of view or just a phrase. And I have some standbys that I use as well. Uh, every morning at 6.30 a.m., an alarm goes off on my phone <laughs> and it says world fitness champion. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, it changes the way I show up in the gym, right? Love it. Uh, at 9 a.m., it says uh, WBC which can mean world's best CEO or world's best coach, changes the way I show up. You know, how does that person act and behave? And then the most important one um, for me goes off at 6.30 p.m. And it says world's best husband and father. And it just prompts the question, as, you know, before I walk to the door, how would the world's best husband and father walk into the house right now? And again, it changes the way you show up for your kids, for your spouse, you know, everything. Love that. Yeah. I need to do that. <laughs> yeah. If I, I turn up sometimes, I'm like tired, can't yeah. be bothered, don't want to speak to anyone. Yeah, so that, that, that energy, right? That Love wears that. off on everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, so that's, um, yeah, mindset is absolutely key. Because once you, once you decide who you want to be, then instead of then trying to build yourself into that persona in one, three, five, ten years time, just decide. What's the identity? Give it a name. Yeah. Decide how does that person behave and then step into it right now. I also... How long have you done that for? Um, I've been doing that a couple of years now and all of my clients you know, love they it. Because the other yeah. thing that I, I, I ask them to do is you know, I call it a champion proof. So you know, you're trying to be your best, the best version of you in each of those areas. Yeah, that's what it's all about. You know, closing the gap between who you are and who you're capable of being in each yeah, of those yeah. areas. So it's so just to clarify again, so it's fitness. Yeah. So health. You know, energy. You know, something around work yeah. and something around you know love or relationships. Right. Yeah. At home. So I encourage people to come up with like your number one action or thing you could do each day, such that by doing it you're in a way proving that the identity you set at the beginning of the day is true. Brilliant. You know, so, yeah, so yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, so to be to be the best at the gym, you've got to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. So today, you know, my for the gym was, it was to burn 700 calories. If I did that, that would be evidence that I was, you know, yeah. the world fitness um, yeah. champion. Nice. Um, and that makes you feel good because you've succeeded in absolutely. your first goal of the day yeah. and it sets you up nicely yeah. for the rest. For the work one, it was actually this podcast. I wanted to make sure I showed up and delivered something that could inspire someone else. Or uh, I think you've done that. Yeah, thank yeah, you. And then for the relationship one for me today, or you know, the home on the home front, it was um, just to send my ma a nice message, you know, because um, she where's she, she in? She's in Chicago. Right, right. So yeah, she loves loves messages. <laughs> so if any any form of a contact, she goes through the roof. <laughs> I love that. And if you succeeded in balancing them, spending as much time with your family yeah. and also yeah. on the work and business. And, and I use balance when I'm talking to people because that's kind of the catch word. The truth is um, you can never perfectly balance it all. So it's less about balance and it's actually more about satisfaction. And satisfaction is linked to, do you believe you're doing your best? Because all suffering, you know, disillusionment, you know, pain, you know, anxiety, it all lives in that gap between, you know, how we're behaving and how we're capable of behaving. Yeah, yeah. And so when that gap's too big, you feel bad. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. That's yeah. so true. Yeah. So, Amazing. Yeah. Well, I think let's end there. Thank you so much for coming in. How do people find you? I am very keen to, um, to identify a single entrepreneur who's in the scale-up phase for their business. Somebody who's got a bias for action, already a track record for success, but yet they're craving something more um, because I have a single coaching spot opening up. Cool. And so anybody who's interested in um, making a real, you know, transformation business-wise and even life-wise, love to be that guide for you. And uh, they can reach me um, uh, by email. Um, you know, I have a website, ericpartaker.com, or they could just shoot me an email, um, eric with a C uh, at chilango.co.uk. Cool. We'll stick that in the show notes. Great. Hopefully... You won't get too many people contacting you. Um, and then you're on LinkedIn and Instagram yeah. and all of that stuff as well, yeah. I guess. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.